You have been tasked to analyze a gasoline engine with a compression ratio of 8 to 1. You know that 750 kilojoules per kilogram of heat is added during the combustion process. And you know that, prior to compression, the air is at 95 kilopascals and 27 degrees Celsius. Assuming the cold air standard, determine or complete the following. A. The maximum temperature and pressure occurring in the process. B. The network output. Note that that's not specified as to if it's specific work or total power. C. The thermal efficiency. D. The mean effective pressure during the cycle. E. The ratio of air to fuel burned during combustion, i.e. the air-fuel ratio. Assuming that the gasoline burned is pure octane. And lastly, part F. Sketch a PV and TS diagram of this cycle. So first of all, let's reflect on the auto cycle itself. In the auto cycle, the process from 1 to 2 is our isentropic compression process. If the pressure and temperature are given prior to compression, that implies that 95 kilopascals is state 1's pressure, and 27 degrees Celsius is state 1's temperature. I know that 750 kilojoules per kilogram of heat is added during the combustion process, which is our process from 2 to 3. Therefore, I can say this is Q in from 2 to 3. Furthermore, since the auto cycle only has one process with heat addition, that's going to be the specific Q in to the entire cycle. The compression ratio was given as 8 to 1. I'm going to note that as R is equal to 8. Then, because we are told to analyze this using the cold air standard, we are going to be using the properties for ideal air at 300 Kelvin. If we jump into our appendices, what we're grabbing are properties from table A20. For ideal air at 300 Kelvin, CP is going to be 1.005, CV is going to be 0 0.718, and K is going to be 1.4. Furthermore, remember that the cold air standard means that we're going to be using the assumption of constant specific heats. So anytime we encounter a delta U or delta H, we are going to be substituting with CP or CV delta T. Furthermore, it means that we can use our isentropic ideal gas equations on any process that is isentropic. Now I'm going to ignore all of the statements that I actually want. And let's just start by approaching this in the same manner that we did our arbitrary power cycle. So ignore all this for the moment. We'll come back to that in a second. Instead, I want us to calculate the temperature, pressure, and specific volume at all four state points. Again, this isn't necessarily the most efficient way to approach this problem but I think it's useful in the learning process. We were told that the pressure prior to compression is 95 kilopascals. Note that that's going to be our ambient air because the process prior to compression is air intake in reality. That's why this is 95 kilopascals about atmospheric pressure in South Dakota and T1 is about a reasonable temperature on a nice warm summer day when you would want to be driving around. 27 degrees Celsius. Furthermore, 27 plus 273.15 is close enough to 300 Kelvin that we could probably call it 300 Kelvin. But for the moment, let's leave it at 300.15. Just like with the arbitrary cycle, we can use our ideal gas law to calculate a specific volume since we know this temperature and pressure. For that, we will summon our calculator. And I'm going to gloss over the calculation of the specific gas constant for air because we've done that in previous problems. Remember that the specific gas constant for air is the universal gas constant, which is 8.314 kilojoules per kilomole Kelvin in the case of our metric unit system here. That number is retrieved from the inside of the front cover of your textbook, that's the bottom left corner of your conversion factor sheet. And you divide by the molar mass of the substance you're analyzing, in this case air. Ideal air has a molar mass of 98.97 kilograms per kilomole. Therefore, we are taking 8.314 divided by 28.97, which is going to be 0.287-ish kilojoules per kilogram Kelvin. Then, 
since PV is equal to RT, V would equal RT over P. So I'm going to take 0.287 kilojoules per kilogram Kelvin, and I'm going to multiply by our temperature in Kelvin, which is 300.15, and then I'm going to divide by 95 kilopascals. And I walked through the unit conversions in that arbitrary cycle analysis that we had performed, so I'm not going to write it out in detail again. But we know we are going to have a result in cubic meters per kilogram. For state number two, we don't have T2, P2, nor V2 yet. The thing that gets us from 1 to 2 is recognizing that we are going from our big volume to our small volume. And we know that that compression ratio, which is a proportion of volume, remember, is 8. So the big volume is going to be 8 times larger than the small volume. Furthermore, because this is a closed system, that means that the proportion of specific volumes is also going to be 8. Therefore, V2 is going to be V1 divided by R, which is 8. So we can take that number we just calculated, divide by 8, and we get 0 0.11346. And with that, we actually have all four specific volumes. Because the process from 2 to 3 is isochoric, and again, because it's a closed system, that means the mass is constant. That means V3 is equal to V2. And then we expand back to our initial specific volume. Because the process from 4 to 1 is isochoric, therefore V4 is also 0 0.907. You could also think of it like the expansion ratio is the reverse of the compression ratio. So instead of going from big volume to small volume, you're going from small volume to big volume, and that proportion is still 8. That is, big volume over small volume is still 8. Therefore, you could think of this like V4 over V3 as well. That gives us one independent intensive property at state 2. The other independent intensive property that we have is our specific entropy. Now we're not actually going to be trying to determine the entropy because we don't necessarily need to. It's just the fact that the entropy is the same that fully defines our state 2. To actually calculate T2 and P2, we will go back to our isentropic ideal gas relations. I have the option of using any of these equations for the process from 1 to 2, but since I have a ratio of volumes, it's probably going to be most convenient for me to use this equation to come up with T2 and this equation to come up with P2. So what I'm going to write is T2 is equal to T1 multiplied by V1 over V2 raised to the K minus 1. And remember, if I multiply the contents of this parentheses by mass over mass, I could write that as specific volume over specific volume, and the same proportion is true, because the mass doesn't change. So what I'm going to write is T2 over T1 is equal to V1 over V2 raised to the K minus 1. Therefore, T2 is equal to T1 multiplied by R raised to the K minus 1. Remember, R, our compression ratio, is big volume over small volume. So if you're trying to think through, should I plug in R or 1 over R, just think through the proportions of actual volume here. Compression is big volume to small volume, so it should be big number over small number, therefore R, not 1 over R. And then our T1 value was 300.15, so I'm going to write this as... 300.15 multiplied by 1.4, nope, 8 raised to the power of 1.4 minus 1. 
and I get a temperature at state 2 of 689.56. Then I follow the same logic with our pressure calculation, except this time I'm using k, not k minus 1. And I can write this as 95 multiplied by 8 raised to the power of 1.4 minus 1. And I get a pressure at state 2 of 218.253. And with that, we are halfway through our state point properties. Next, we need to consider the process from state 2 to state 3. I know that my ideal gas law would allow me to write PV is equal to RT. Since I have an isochoric process, I can write this as V over R is equal to T over P. Since this quantity on the left is the same at state 2 as it is at state 3, that means I can write T2 over P2 is equal to T3 over P3, which means that I could write T3 is equal to, here, I need something to point at. I can write T3 is equal to T2 over P2 times P3, or I could write P3 is equal to T3 over T2 times P2. However, neither one of those is helpful right now. I have one equation and two unknowns. I don't know T3. I don't know P3. So what is the thing that gets me from state 2 to state 3? It is the specific heat input. I know 750 kilojoules of heat is added between 2 and 3. So if I were to write this out as an energy balance, I'm saying we have an isochoric process, the piston isn't moving because we're assuming that the combustion happens instantly. Therefore, I can write this as delta U plus delta KE plus delta PE. That's equal to little Q in plus little work in minus little Q out plus little work out. Note that I am neglecting the first several steps of the energy balance, jumping immediately to this form. I'm canceling the changes in kinetic and potential energy because I'm assuming that the changes in kinetic and potential energy of the system itself are negligible. Next, I'm neglecting works because I have an isochoric process and Q out because the heat is added. Therefore, the Q in from 2 to 3 is equal to U3 minus U2. And then you know what's happening next, right? That's right, because I have assumed constant specific heats, because I was told to use the cold air standard, which has, as part of it, assuming that the heat capacity is constant at 300 Kelvin, then I can plug in CV multiplied by T3 minus T2. Therefore, T3 is equal to QN over CV plus T2. So I'm going to say T3 is equal to 750 kilojoules per kilogram divided by 0 0.718 kilojoules per kilogram Kelvin. The kilojoules and the kilograms are both going to cancel, leaving me with Kelvin in the numerator. And then I am going to add T2, which is 689.56. And I get 1734.13. And then now that I have one of our temperature or pressure at state threes, I can say P3 is equal to P2 multiplied by T3 over T2. So I have 218.25. Multiplied by... 1734.13 divided by 689.564 and just for good measure here 
I'm actually just gonna jump up and grab our P2 property that we calculated because you know now is really the time to be a stickler about all those decimal places. And we get a pressure at state three of 548.86 kilopascals. The last process we have to consider is the process from three to four. That process is isentropic expansion. Because it's isentropic expansion and because we are assuming constant specific heat, we can use our isentropic ideal gas relations again. So we are essentially doing the same thing that we did here. We are just writing it as T4 over T3 is equal to V3 over V4 raised to the K minus one. Because in our isentropic ideal gas relations equation sheet, one really represents the beginning of the process, two really represents the end of the process. Now, do I plug in R here, or do I plug in 1 over R? That's right. V3 is smaller than V4, therefore it's 1 over R. So I'm going to take T3 multiplied by 1 over R raised to the K minus 1. T3 was 1734.13 multiplied by 1 over 8 raised to the power of forgot, I have to push the caret button on the calculator, I'm in there, I can't just type caret on the keyboard, raised to the quantity of 1.4 minus 1. And I get 784.823 Kelvin. And then I'm going to repeat that process with K instead of K minus 1. For the pressure form of this equation, I'm going to take P4 is equal to P3 multiplied by 1 over R raised to the power of K. So P3 was 548.866 multiplied by 1 over 8 raised to the power of 1.4. So I've calculated a quantity here that is 29.864. Now I could write that down, however, all right, here, let's just step through this. I'm writing this down. Definitely gonna leave it. Definitely permanent. Okay, now let's think through whether or not these state point properties make sense. We have, first of all, an isentropic compression process. We are decreasing the specific volume, and as a result, our pressure should increase, and our temperature should increase as well. That makes sense. Then, we are adding heat to our process at the same specific volume. Therefore, our temperature should increase and our pressure should increase. The fact that we ended with a higher temperature and pressure makes sense. Then we are expanding to draw power out of the gas, so the temperature should drop, and the pressure should drop. But our process from four to one is going to be an isochoric cooling process. So we would expect our temperature to drop and our pressure to drop. So the fact that we're going from 29.86 down to 95, oh wait, no we don't. This is indicating that the pressure would rise during the cooling process that occurs at a constant volume. That doesn't match what I know would happen because the ideal gas law says that pressure and temperature are going to be directly related for a process at a constant volume. Therefore, this implies I have a mistake. This is the value of thinking through your state points to double check that they make sense before you move on. So let's double check all of our pressure calculations, shall we? P2 is equal to P1 multiplied by, <clears throat> there we go. So our mistake occurred back when we calculated P2. I'm sure that many of you were screaming at your screens, indicating to me that I had made an error but I was just moving on to the calculation. As you know now, that was totally on purpose and here to serve as a learning opportunity. So what we have to do is rework P2, P3, and P4. And get rid of the minus one because in our pressure equation here, 
This doesn't have k minus 1, this just has k. There is no minus 1, so I should not have subtracted 1 from the exponent. So, at state 2, I have a pressure of 1,746.02, and then I'm going to take that quantity, I'm going to multiply by 1734.13 divided by 689.56, and I get 4,090. 390.96 and then I am going to take that quantity and multiply by 1 over 8 raised to the power of just 1.4 and I get 238.909 now let's think through that again our pressure goes up when we are isentropically compressing that makes sense we have an isochoric heat addition process. The pressure increases as the temperature increases in a constant volume process. That makes sense. Then the pressure drops as the gas expands. That makes sense. And then we have an isochoric cooling process where the temperature and pressure both drop again. I could go one step further in my number crunching here and recognize that the same ideal gas equation simplification that we came up for 2 to 3 is also going to be true from 4 to 1. So I should be able to write T4 over P4 is equal to T1 over P1. Therefore, P1 should equal T1 over T4 multiplied by P4. So if I get the same pressure at state 1 that I started with, that implies that I did everything correctly. So I'm going to take 238.91 and I'm going to multiply by 300.15 divided by 784.82. And I, of course, know that I should have a little bit of discrepancy here due to rounding errors. But let's see what happens. We get 91.3695. I wonder if we can make that even tighter here. Hey, look at that. When we grabbed all the decimal places, we got 95.0006. That's a very strong indication that we at least used all the calculations correctly. Now that we have all of our state point properties, the world is our oyster. So before we move on to calculating the stuff that I actually want us to calculate, I would instead like us to calculate the specific work, the specific QN, the specific workout, and the specific QOut occurring in this cycle. I know that work in for an auto cycle is going to occur in 1 to 2, and because I have an isentropic process, the heat transfers are going to disappear, and I'm left with U2 minus U1. For my heat addition term, I know that that's going to be U3 minus U2 because of my above energy balance, and we know that that's just going to be 750 kilojoules per kilogram. My workout is occurring between 3 and 4. Again, I have isentropic expansion, therefore the heat transfer terms are going to disappear. And I'm going to be left with workout and delta U, so I can write this as U3 minus U4. And to all of you asking, why is it 3 minus 4 instead of 4 minus 1? Remember that I have delta U is equal to work in minus work out. Work in disappears because the work is only out, therefore it's delta U is equal to negative work out. So I would write U4 minus U3 is equal to negative work out, therefore the actual work out is U3 minus U4. And then similarly for Q out, again because Q out is going to be in the energy out term, therefore has a negative in front of it, this is going to be U4 minus U1 because it's beginning minus end. Then I'm going to substitute in CV delta T here, so I have CV times T2 minus T1, CV times T3 minus T4, and CV times T4 minus T1. So if I scroll on up to my temperatures here, I can just crunch some numbers. My specific work in would be 0 0.718 multiplied by 
minus 300.15, 279.596. Just for good measure here, let's calculate the heat transfer in and double check that we actually get 750. And we do, which is good. Then our workout term would be 0 0.718 multiplied by the quantity 1734.13 minus 784.82. And we get 681.605. And then 0 0.718 multiplied by 784.82 minus 300.15 and we get 347.993. I bumped my iPad with my elbow and it scrolled up. So, sorry for all the nausea, this is undoubtedly inducing. But I had 279.596 kilojoules per kilogram. Can confirm that that is indeed 750. My workout term is 681.605. And my Q out term is 347.993. Then because this is a power cycle, I should have net work in the outward direction, which is going to be work out minus work in. So I will write that as 681.605 minus 279.596, and I get a 402. I guess we can write 402.01. I mean, come on, John, be at least a little bit consistent. And then, just to check myself, I'm going to take 750 minus 347.993, and I get 402. And I would bet if I use this 750.001 instead of the 750 that it should have been, I would actually get the exact same number. Hey, look at that, it's the exact same number. Let's just round these to 0.01. That's easier all along. Cool, we have a net workout, we have a net queue in. Now let's start to actually consider what the problem statement actually wants. First up, I had maximum temperature and pressure occurring in the cycle. Well, T max is going to be T3. I know that for a couple of reasons. First of all, it is the highest number. It is the only one, in fact, that has four digits. Wow, that's a big number. I don't know why I'm running T. It's 1734.13. The other reason I know that is because, as a general rule of thumb, in a power cycle, it is going to be the hottest after the heat addition process. I.e., it is going to be the highest temperature after the fire thing happens. Where there's fire, there is often a high temperature. So general rule of thumb, your highest temperature is going to correspond to the state point after your heat addition process. And our pressure is correlated so closely with temperature that our state point with the highest temperature is going to have our highest pressure as well. So 4,390.96. Then, part B, I wanted the network output. So I have that already as a specific term. It is 402.01. Now, do I have the ability to determine a power? I don't. I have no indication of size. There's no mass that I actually know. Therefore, I cannot multiply by any sort of mass or size that would represent mass to come up with an actual power. All I can quantify is the network out on a specific basis. 
I'm giving it per unit mass that flows through the cycle. That's the best I can do. For part C, the thermal efficiency of this power cycle is going to be the network out divided by heat transfer in, which is going to be 402.01 divided by 750, and I get 53.6%. For part D, I am determining the mean effective pressure during the cycle. Well, just a brief recap, the mean effective pressure is the pressure that, if held constant, would yield the same specific network. So if this piston cylinder arrangement was held with air at a constant pressure, and push the piston down, what pressure would yield the same specific network? Well, if I'm describing a displacement here, I can describe that as the piston moving from top dead center, which I can call X1, down to bottom dead center, which I could call X2. So the relevant work here is going to be the integral of force with respect to displacement. And my force is going to come from pressure. Since pressure is defined as a force distributed across an area, that force is going to be pressure times area, which when combined into my integral, gives me pressure times area times dx. Since my volume swept by the piston is a cylinder that has a constant area, I'm going to group together these terms into dv, a volume differential, and I can write this as the integral of pressure with respect to the volume. And then the pressure is constant because the hypothetical quantity that I'm calculating, the mean effective pressure is an average pressure. I'm assuming it's a constant, so it comes out. Therefore, I have pressure multiplied by change in volume. So the net work out here would be the mean effective pressure multiplied by delta volume. Therefore, the mean effective pressure, which by the way, the book abbreviates PMEF, but I write it as MEP, is net workout over delta volume. If I were to divide the numerator and denominator by mass, I could also write this as net workout over delta specific volume. And since I'm talking about going from top dead center to bottom dead center, that's going to be our smallest volume to our biggest volume. That is going to be V1 minus V2. Cool. Now that I have that equation, I can actually calculate a quantity. So I will pause here for a second. Actually, I'll leave it. I'll leave it. Mean effective pressure for this process is 402.008 divided by my specific volume of state 1, which was 0 0.90 something. I'm going to go on a scrolling adventure to find that in my calculator. Minus that same number divided by 8. Note that because it's the same number divided by 8, I could factor out the same number and then multiply by 1 minus 1 over 8. But at this point, I'm already down this path, so I'm going to take the actual number. And I get... 506.676. So, what does that number represent? Not a whole lot. I mean, it's very abstract. It doesn't relate to any pressure in the actual cycle. It's a pressure that if you were to hold constant and then 
sweep the piston through the same space, you get the same network out. And that's useful for a type of comparison between engines, because generally speaking, the one with the higher mean effective pressure is the one that is going to produce more power. But there's so many other scale values, and there are so many other ways of comparing engines to one another that it is not actually that tangibly useful anymore. But we still calculate it because it is a quantity that you can calculate from the parameters of the engine. So sometimes it's useful and in those very rare circumstances, you should know how to calculate it or at least be vaguely familiar with what it represents. Next up, the air fuel ratio. For that, I am going to write down here again. I was thinking about going to a new page. I'll save that for the diagrams. Part E here. I want the ratio of air to fuel, which I'm going to abbreviate AFR. That's air fuel ratio. And the AFR here is going to be the mass of air to mass of fuel in the engine. Now, I know what you're thinking. You're thinking, but John, we don't know the mass of air, nor do we know the mass of fuel. So how can we possibly calculate this? Well, instead of approaching it from its definition, let's think about what's happening in the heat addition process. We are adding heat to the engine by burning fuel. And if we assume that all of the heat produced by the combustion process is going into the air, which is a big assumption here, then I can write them as being equal to one another. And I can write this as a magnitude as well, which would just be across the process as opposed to per unit time. And if I do that, I can write this as mass of air times a specific Q in is equal to mass of fuel times the heating value of the fuel. That is, since specific Q in is given per unit mass of air in the cycle, we are describing the total heat added by taking that specific quantity and multiplying it by the mass of air. Then we are using the heating value of the fuel multiplied by the mass of the fuel to come up with a total heat emitted by burning the fuel. And now we can write this as the mass of air over the mass of fuel is equal to the heating value of the fuel divided by Q in. And that would give us our air fuel ratio. So Q in we know is 750 ish kilojoules per kilogram of air. And our heating value for fuel is going to be the heating value of octane. We were told to treat the fuel as pure octane. So we go back into our appendices. On table A25, we have a variety of heating values for a variety of substances, including but not limited to octane. Now, we have two different types of octane, and we have two different types of heating values. So we're going to be using one of these four numbers. Now, which number we choose is based on a couple of assumptions that we need to make. First of all, do we treat the fuel as being a vapor G or a liquid L? For our purposes right now, we are just going to use the vaporized value for fuel. We are treating it as a liquid that then evaporates. That is a better way of modeling the engine if you are trying to be more accurate, but then you have to account for the latent energy of the fuel and that energy is lost from the air and it becomes a bit of a more tedious calculation. And since our analysis is an overview and is a, an idealized form of the model anyway, we are going to neglect that. If you want to get more information on accurate ways to model an engine and the simplifications we make in the auto cycle and how we can adapt them to become a little bit more accurate, you should take the Internal Combustion Engines Tech Collective. But for now, we're grabbing from this row here. Then we have to consider whether or not we should treat this as a higher heating value or a lower heating value. General rule of thumb, if you don't know for sure, use the lower heating value. The higher heating value is more appropriate in situations where you are recovering 
every last bit of energy that you possibly can. Like if you consider a natural gas furnace, the output of a natural gas furnace has some products that you can recover a little bit more energy from. Really, really high efficiency natural gas furnaces can, for example, condense the steam that has been produced in the combustion process. That vaporized water, when condensed, is going to dump a little bit of energy back into your system. So in a very high efficiency circumstance, you may need to use a higher heating value. Your system would also have intricacies to be able to actually make that happen. Since we are just burning fuel within a tiny piston cylinder arrangement with reckless abandon, we are going to be using the lower heating value and neglecting this little bit of recovered energy that we could get if we had really, really specific types of combustion processes. So our value is 44,790. Again, we are using vaporized octane already. We aren't trying to account for how the liquid becomes a vapor and whether we should use the heating value of a liquid and not account for the latent energy or try to account for the latent energy. We're just treating it as a vapor for now. And we're using the lower heating value because we don't have the complexities that would recover that little bit of additional energy from the products. Okay. That was a very long-winded way of coming up with 44,790 kilojoules per kilogram of fuel. Then, when I divide these two quantities, I should get... One thousand four hundred ninety-three twenty-fifths. Thank you, calculator. Come on, calculator. About fifty-nine point seven two. So I kind of ran out of room here, but there really should be units on that. It's not just a unitless proportion, even though it is kilograms per kilogram, because they are different kilograms. Yeah, that's not at all confusing. This is kilograms of air per kilogram of fuel, which could be grams of air per gram of fuel, or pound mass of air per pound mass of fuel. This is a proportion of the mass of air per mass of fuel. And this is useful because it gives us an indication as to the headroom that's left. 14.7 mass units of air per mass units of fuel. So what this means is we have about four times as much air as we need to actually accomplish this combustion process. So theoretically, a person could throttle up this engine, add more fuel to it, and multiply the amount of fuel by about four times and still have approximately good combustion. Lastly, we have part F, which is to sketch a PV and TS diagram of this cycle. So for that, I'm going to jump over to a new page. And I'm going to begin by creating some axes. Now remember, movement to the right on a PV diagram, represents work out, moving to the left, represents work in. And those are reversed on the TS diagram. Movement to the left, represents Q out, moving to the right, represents Q in. And again, just because we have actual specific volume numbers doesn't mean that I want us to use those. I want to think about how the work is going to appear on the PV diagram. So how many different opportunities for work do we have? We have two. The process from one to two is a work in. Therefore, from one to two, I should step from the right to the left. And then two to three has no work occurring because it's isochoric. Then three to four is an expansion process, so we have work out. And then four to one is isochoric, so we have no work. So one to two, two to three, three to four, four to one. I should have two specific volumes, big volume, small volume. And I'm going to label those V1 and V2. And again, we actually know them because we calculated them. But what I'm looking for on these graphs is relative positioning of the state points. 
you wouldn't have needed to calculate the specific volume for this part of the analysis. Now we could do the same thing for pressure, recognizing that we have the smallest pressure at state one, and then we are increasing to a higher pressure at state two, and then we are increasing again. Here, let's draw more like this. We are increasing again to P3, and then we are cooling off between four and one, so we should drop just a little bit, so our expansion should go from three all the way down to four. And then I can draw state one, state two, state three, and state four. And then I know that movement to the left is going to represent our work in. So work in from one to two is going to be this region under this curve. And then movement from left to right from three to four represents our work out. So this quantity here is work out. So when I take work out minus work in, what I'm left with is this quantity inside, which means that this represents our network out. Now let's do the same thing for our TS diagram. Movement to the left represents Q out, movement to the right represents Q in. I have one process that has a Q in term, I have one process that has a Q out term, and it goes no heat transfer from 1 to 2, and then heat transfer in from 2 to 3, no heat transfer from 3 to 4, and then heat transfer out from 4 to 1. So 1 and 2 should be over here, 3 and 4 should be over here. So I will call this S1 and S3. Then we know that we are increasing our temperature when we compress, we are increasing it when we add heat to our process. We are trying to get as much energy as we can, which means it's going to drop a lot. Then we have cooling between 4 and 1, so it should drop just a bit. So I'm going to draw this as T1, and then T2, and then T3, and then T4 back down here. So state one is going to be here, state two is going to be here, state three is going to be here, and state four is going to be here. And just like with our PV diagram, we could take the area under the curve from 1 to 4 and recognize that this is our Q out. The area under the curve from 2 to 3 and recognize that this area represents our Q in. Therefore, Q in minus Q out would leave us with this region here, which is the net Q in, which is also equal to network out. So these are our approximate shape of our PV and TS diagrams for this example problem. These graphs are a little bit crude, perhaps, but they illustrate what's happening in the process. If you understand how a horizontal displacement represents work and heat transfer on the PV and TS diagrams, and you can reason through what vertical displacement implies about temperature and pressure changing over processes, you can interpret a graph and have a pretty good idea of what's happening in a cycle, or you can draw out the graph for a cycle without even having specific numbers. If we wanted a better graph and better numbers, I would recommend completing this on a computer that doesn't have the same inability to keep track of decimal places that I do, or inability to draw, say, lines of constant specific volume on a TS diagram, or lines of specific entropy on a PV diagram. For that, I will turn to my friendly neighborhood MATLAB. That's a calculator. Friendly neighborhood MATLAB. That's a MATLAB and a calculator. Well done, OBS. So in this MATLAB code, I'm performing the exact same calculations that we did by hand. We looked up a heating value of octane of 44,790. We looked up a CV and CP value from the back of our textbook. We have our given information, and then we are just calculating the process from one to two using isentropic ideal gas relations, two to three using an isochoric process, three to four using isentropic ideal gas relations, taking CV delta T for all the things, calculating a network out, 
and then calculating a thermal efficiency, mean effective pressure, and air fuel ratio. And note that what we get is approximately the same as what we had for our properties. We have 1733.73 instead of our temperature, which was 1734.13. And we have 4389.93 instead of 4390.96. Have a net workout that's about three kilojoules per kilogram higher and a thermal efficiency that is off by about 0.15%. Now, in this class, you're going to be expected to complete the work by hand, but I would encourage you to get proficient at completing them in MATLAB as well. First of all, it allows you to spend less time on the calculations themselves and more time on the engineering side of things, thinking through processes, coming up with relationships between properties, and even things like plotting out the PV and TS diagram are much faster and more accurate in MATLAB. Note here that I'm plotting out the PV diagram with two lines of constant specific volume and two lines of constant entropy, and this is all graphed to scale properly. Also note that the PV diagrams are generally given with a logarithmic scale on the x-axis. That's one of the reasons I'm not particular about using our actual specific volumes to place their positions on the PV diagram that we draw by hand. Note on the TS diagram, we have two lines of constant entropy and two lines of constant specific volumes, but the general shape of the plots is the same. We were able to think through how the properties are affected by the processes and therefore what the general shape should look like. Furthermore, just to elaborate again, you should be able to look at a PV and TS diagram and deduce, hey, there's going to be work in from one to two, there's going to be heat addition, probably isochorically from two to three, there's going to be work out from three to four, and then there's going to be heat reduction. I know that I'm decreasing my pressure, which probably implies a decrease in temperature at a constant specific volume for an ideal gas. And then looking at the TS diagram, you can confirm, ah, yes, we have compression from one to two, and then we are adding heat, which we know because it's a horizontal displacement to the right from two to three. And then we have an expansion process from three to four, isentropically because our entropy doesn't change. And then we are going from four to back to one with a heat reduction, with a heat output from right to left to get back to our initial temperature. I have posted this code on D2L, so you can poke through it if you want. Another nice thing about this is that if you wanted to perform a parametric analysis, say you wanted to change a thing and to see how that affected your results, you can do that very quickly on MATLAB. Like, let's say that we were considering by hand how compression ratio affects the thermal efficiency of our auto cycle. If we jump back into our handwritten calculations, I want to see how R affects thermal efficiency. Well, to do that, it's probably easiest to write out our thermal efficiency and look for ways that R can appear. I have network out divided by Q in, which is work out minus work in divided by Q in, which is Q in minus Q out divided by Q in because remember the network out and the net heat transfer in should be the same and then I'm going to write that as 1 minus Q out over Q in. Then our Q out term appears between 4 and 1 so I can write this as 1 minus ZV times T4 minus T1 because it's an output, that means there's a negative on the right-hand side of the energy balance, so it goes from end to beginning, and then is flipped, so it's beginning to end. And then in the denominator, I have CV multiplied by T3 minus T2, because it's a Q in term. We are not having to deal with the negation of the delta U, so it's just end minus beginning. And then because of the cold air standard, the CVs cancel, so I'm left with 1 minus T4 minus T1, divided by T3 minus T2, and I can... Factor out T1 from the numerator, this is T1 multiplied by T4 over T1 minus 1 over T2 multiplied by T3 over T2 minus T over T, it would just be 1 again. Now to try to reduce this further, I'm going to split this into two chunks. First we'll consider the right, then we'll consider the left. On the right side, we have T4 over T1 minus 1 
divided by t3 over t2 minus 1. Now to figure out how these are related or correlated, I'm going to write out all of my processes in terms of temperatures. And to do that, I think I'm gonna need a little bit more space. So let's start a new page. So the question for the moment is, how are these related to one another? Are they directly proportional? Are they indirectly proportional? Are they, can they be reduced to a function of R, etc.? And I'm going to approach this by writing out how my pressures are all calculated, because the pressures are going to be determined as a function of temperatures, and if I make the substitutions, I should be able to write P1 on one side, and then all of the rest of the calculations in terms of temperatures on the other, and with any luck I'll end up with P1 in the numerator on the right hand side, and then I can reduce to just a function that has to equal 1. So let's try this out. First of all, I was given P1, then I know P2 was calculated by taking P1 raised to the R to the K value, not to be confused with K minus 1, in that totally on purpose mistake that we, you know, learned together from. P3 was P2 multiplied by T3 over T2. And then P4 was P3 multiplied by the quantity 1 over R to the just K, not K minus 1. And then lastly, we got back to state 1 by taking P4 multiplied by T1 over T4, I think. I'm pretty sure. P1 over P4 equals T1 over T4. Yeah, that makes sense. So. If I start my substitution process by starting at the end and working backwards, I should be able to write P1 is equal to P3 multiplied by 1 over R to the K, that's this term here, and then I multiply by T1 over T4. And I work backwards again, I can say P3 is equal to P2 multiplied by T3 over T2. multiplied by 1 over r to the k, multiplied by t over t, okay. And then p2 was p1 multiplied by r to the k, and then all the rest of the things. Then I know since P1 is equal to P1 times this quantity, I can conclude that this entire quantity has to equal 1. So I can say R to the K times T3 over T2 times 1 over R to the K times T1 over T4 has to equal 1 because I know that I have to multiply something by P1 and get P1, so it has to be 1. Then I know that if R is a positive quantity, and I guess K is a positive quantity, then I can say R to the K times 1 over R to the K must equal 1. I mean, you could write that out as a series expansion if you wanted, but honestly, the way that I approach that kind of calculation is to recognize that I'm taking essentially x raised to a positive integer. So I could say like x squared for the purposes of this analysis multiplied by 1 over x squared. And that's the equivalent of running x times x times 1 over x times 1 over x. And if you rewrite that as x over x times x over x, you just get 1 because x over x is 1 and x over x is 1, therefore 1 times 1 is 1. Anyway, if those terms multiplied together are 1, then that means t3 over t3, no, t3 over t2 multiplied by t1 over t4 is equal to 1. Now we are cooking with peanut oil. So I can say T3 over T2 is equal to, if I divide by T1 over T4, I'm gesturing at my iPad, I realize that you guys can't see that, 
So it's unhelpful, but I'm saying T3 over T2 is equal to T4 over T1. Now, if T3 over T2 is equal to T4 over T1, then that means T3 over T2 minus 1 must equal T4 over T1 minus 1. So back before we entered the algebra dimension, if we are looking at this equation here, I can say this entire block simplifies to just one. So for the cold air standard, the thermal efficiency of an auto cycle is going to be one minus T1 over T2. Isn't that cool? I mean, we, we could have calculated the thermal efficiency. That's like part D of our question once we figured out T2. Let's see if we can take that even further. Well, I know T2 was calculated by taking T1 multiplied by R to the K minus one. Therefore, T1 over T2 is going to be one over R to the K minus one. Neat. So for the cold air standard only, make sure that you write that in big bold letters only cold air standard because I had to assume constant specific heats to get this far way back over in this step. I guess you could write that as only if you've assumed constant specific heats evaluated at the same temperature because I also need CV to cancel. So any temperature would work, but okay, potato, potato. Thermal efficiency of an auto cycle could be reduced to one minus one over R to the K minus one. That means that as I increase my compression ratio, I am also going to be increasing my thermal efficiency. Furthermore, I know that that line is going to look something like this. I mean, again, forgive the very crude graph, but as my compression ratio increases, my thermal efficiency increases, but we reach less and less improvement in thermal efficiency for each increase in compression ratio. Therefore, increasing from, say, 7 to 8 is not going to be as much of an increase as increasing from 6 to 7. So, we can confidently say increasing the compression ratio will improve the thermal efficiency of an auto cycle, but the higher your compression ratio, the less effective those gains are. Again, going from 7 to 8 is not as much as going from 6 to 7. Or going from 12 to 13 is going to improve it, but not as much as going from 8 to 9, etc. We got there, again, by entering the algebra dimension, but we also could just look at our MATLAB code. We could say, what if we change 8 to 9? How does that affect our thermal efficiency? It goes from 56.45 to 56, 58.45. That's pretty neat. What if we keep going? What if we go to 10? Come on, potato. 60.16. Note, it went up 2%, and then it went up 1 point, like... I'm not here to do math. Something less than 2, or more than 1. It went up by a smaller amount the second time than the first time. I could actually just run this in a loop and have it calculate the thermal efficiency for a whole bunch of compression ratios and graph them. And in fact, I have. This code, again, available on D2L if you want to poke through it, is determining the thermal efficiency for all values of compression ratio between 2 and 15 for this problem by increments of 0 0.05. So, let's let the potato do its work. So I'm having it plot at each step. So if Improving the compression ratio always improves thermal efficiency, then why don't we just drive around gasoline-powered cars and have a compression ratio of, like, 25? 
Well, that gets into another conversation about how the fuel is ignited versus how it would be ignited if it had too high of a compression ratio. The temperature of the fuel mixed in with the air is going to increase as the temperature of the air increases, and at a certain point, the temperature of the air increases past the flash point of the fuel. When that happens, the fuel burns before it's supposed to. It combusts during the compression process, which is not what we want. Some of you may have heard that, especially if you have a high performance engine and you're burning fuel with too low of an octane. The octane of the fuel that you buy from a gas station is related to how much you can compress it before it begins to auto ignite. So a higher octane fuel is going to have a higher flash point, which means that you can have a higher compression ratio before you begin to auto ignite your fuel before it's supposed to. But even that, the high octane fuel can only be compressed a little bit more in order to have an engine that can have a very high compression ratio without concerning itself with auto igniting the fuel we need to inject the fuel after the compression process and for that we are going to be turning to the diesel cycle which we will get to after we talk about the auto cycle a little bit more i will also point out that the compression ratio for most gasoline engines is somewhere between about 8 and 12 whereas Diesel cycles are typically closer to 18 or 20 or 24 in really high compression ratio cases. If you'll forgive a little bit of a tangent about octane and fuels, that when we pull petroleum out of the ground, when we have crude oil that comes up, it is a mix of hydrocarbons. That is, molecules that are carbon surrounded by hydrogen, and we have a combination of short hydrocarbons and long hydrocarbons, and when we go through the refining process, we are allowing them to separate so that we can grab out exactly what we want. The other thing that's interesting about that is as the hydrocarbon lengths get longer, their flash point temperatures increase, their boiling point increases, their freezing point increases, and what you get are substances that are generally vapors at room temperature for very short lengths. I mean, you have your propane and your butane, etc. Then as you start to get longer in the about 7 to 11 carbon atoms length chain that's our gasoline so that's liquid at room temperature but just barely like have you ever noticed how quickly a gasoline evaporates when you spill it on the ground at a gas station that's because its boiling point is relatively close to room temperature when you compare it to say water that octane measurement on the fuel pump at the gas station is an indication of how much of that mixture is a longer chain. If, if, if what you get is all sevens, then that's going to combust at a lower temperature than if what you get is all eights. It's called octane for a reason. How many of your molecules are at eight or higher in some cases, or just eight? And as we keep going up, we start to get into diesel or uh, burning fuel oil, where you have, say, 11 to 14 kerosenes in that range. Go a little bit higher, and you have liquids that are almost solid at room temperature that's where you get into lubricating oils if you go up a little bit further you have solids at room temperature so say paraffin wax that's a solid but just barely because its freezing point is so close to room temperature you keep going up you get asphalt which is a solid at room temperature and takes quite a bit of heat before it liquefies 